Skull. Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore, where today, as promised, we will be looking at the Flesh Terrors chapter. Gabriel Seth's maddened bunch of bloodthirsty mongrels. A not entirely undeserved reputation, either. The Flesh Terrors have been a rather berserk chapter from their very inception. In the second founding, when the legions were split apart by a reboot Gilliman's decree that no man should ever again command the full might of an Astartes legion. Though, perhaps even a chapter was too much power to place into the hands of Nazir Ahmet, the Flesh Terror, after whom the chapter was named. Nazir was a man of a considerable temper, and a tremendous fighter, dual-wielding chain fists. <laughs> because why not? He was also one of very few individuals in the entire galaxy to have not only fought Khan of the World Eaters and lived, but he had even wounded the berserk first captain of Angron's Legion. Less gloriously, Nazir Ahmet was also amongst the Blood Angels driven mad by the Red Thirst during the cornered trap laid in the Cygnus Cluster in an effort to try and convert Sanguinius and his entire Legion to the cause of chaos. During the apocalyptic battle between the forces of Khorne, entire legions of demons, bloodletters, and juggernauts versus the blood angels, Sanguinius himself was wounded by Kabanda, the Cornet Demon Lord. After his wounding, the legion descended into a maddened, frothing, berserk rage and slaughtered the Cornet demons. But tragically, a small group of space wolves under the command of Helic Redknife, who had been dispatched to keep an eye on Sanguinius after the Primarch Magnus betrayed the Edict of Nikea, were caught up in the midst of the battle and were butchered by Nazir Ahmet and his fifth company Blood Angels. After the successful conclusion of the battle, and the Blood Angels' victory over the forces of Chaos, and Sanguinius resisting the lure of Khorne, Nazir and his men came back to their senses. Horrified at his actions, Ahmed immediately confessed his crime to Raldaran, the commander of the Sanguinary Guard, and begged that the matter be brought before Sanguinius so he could be punished for his crimes, but Raldoran revealed that he had already lied to Sanguinius about the fate of the Space Wolves, and if their true destiny were to be revealed now, Sanguinius would be unable to keep the secret from his brother Russ, which would almost certainly end with the two Primarchs coming to blows, and splitting the Loyalist faction in the midst of the Horus Heresy. Thusly unable to ever repent for his horrific actions, the guilt of them would crush Nazir Ahmed for the remainder of his life. This manifested as an even greater drive towards aggression and violence at Nazir and his company. They were forever at the absolute forefront of the fighting during the Horus Heresy, ever ready to rip and rend their enemies apart in a welter of bloody gore. Their zeal was such that Sanguinius personally chastised Ahmet for his lack of control and ordered him to keep his emotions in check during the Battle of Firm. And if anyone would think that Nazir and the Flesh Terrors were bad before, the death of Sanguinius at the hands of the Arch Traitor saw them renounce any pretense of control, any measure of restraint. 
From that moment forward, ever since the second founding, they existed for no other purpose than to annihilate the heretical traitors that had torn their Primarch from them. The freshly formed flesh terrors, with their chapter master at their head, would rip a gory trench through the retreating traitor forces as they were driven back towards the Eye of Terror. For many murderous millennia afterwards, the flesh terrors would continue their personal crusade as a fleet based chapter roaming far beyond the authority of the rallying Imperium, the Flesh Terrors used this freedom to go after the enemies they thought most deserving of their ungentle attention. Even though the heresy had ended in Horus's defeat, much of the Imperium was still beyond the grasp of terror. Thousands of worlds had declared for the traitor Warmaster. Thousands more had declared their independence. There were billions, trillions of traitors, heretics, malcontents, and secessionists to be dealt with. And many of them would be personally taken care of by the flesh terrors. But after several millennia of chastisement and crusades, the chapter's ranks were beginning to grow thin, not merely just to enemy action, but to ever increasing occurrences of what would become known as the Black Rage, where Battle Brothers would be permanently lost to maddened insanity, doomed to repeat the scene of Sanguinius's death for eternity. But the dwindling numbers did not over much bother the chapter master. He had been seeking an end for millennia now, and if it would have to be a slow, withering one, then that would be good enough. Perhaps that would even be precisely what he deserved. But then the flesh terrors came across an abnormality an unusually enormous planet. Gigantified beyond all normal scopes, the world was covered in a deep near impenetrable fog, as if it was a hiding from the rest of the galaxy, or if it had some sort of deep-seated secret to be unveiled. The world was called Cretacea. Nazir Ahmed almost immediately felt a sort of connection to the strange world. There were no traitors or turncoats here, no heretics or mutants or xenos to slay, and the world was not one of any noted significance, yet Amir nevertheless ordered a deployment onto its surface. As the red and black transport ships of the Flesh Terrors carved through the dense cloud layer of the planet, they saw beneath them a world covered from horizon to horizon in deep, choking jungles, broken only by fetid marshlands. Just one glance from the air was more than enough to see that this was a death world a planet near immimicable to human life, ruled over by hostile flora and fauna. The first Thunderhawks down had to literally crash into the trees, their heavy armored hulls easily shattering the trunks and tearing open a landing point. After that, Flesh Terrors armed with flamers marched out from the assault ramps and began clearing the surrounding brush with flamers. But they were soon set upon by insectoid creatures fully the size of a grown man that came rushing out of the undergrowth with such speed and weight as to be able to barrel a fully armored Astartes onto his back. This was but the first encounter with the local population. The planet turned out to be absolutely covered in a near infinite variety of increasingly lethal animals. 
centuries or possibly millennia of cutthroat natural evolution had led to an incredible arms race. No sooner had a creature developed a superior spear before its prey developed impenetrable armor, only for it to be pierced by an even sharper set of fangs, only for them in turn to be thwarted by more armor and so on and so on, until the largest, most dominant life forms on the planet were the size of scout titans, capable of ripping apart entire squads of flesh tearers before being brought down by space marines clambering over their hulks, tearing into them with chainswords, and blasting great craters into their skin with bolt pistols. Any other Imperial force would have left immediately. There was no enemy to fight here, there were no civilians to protect, just a threatening, ugly, dangerous clump of mud spinning through the galaxy. Nothing of value, no resources worth the danger, no reason to stay. The flesh terrors, however, immediately began clearing out new landing areas as the entire chapter descended down to the surface to measure their metal against the monsters they had encountered. Squad upon squad would march out into the jungle seeking out the most ferocious creatures they could to kill them and bring them back as trophies. Ostensibly, officially, they reported that they were investigating the planet. They were securing it in the glory of the Emperor's name. Course. As the flesh terrors lost themselves in the simple joy of absolute unrestrained slaughter. But then, Nazir Ahmet's strange sense of connection to the world made itself apparent, as unbelievably, humans were discovered. This planet, so brutal that even fully armored space marines were routinely made the prey of the monsters that stalked the jungle depths, had somehow managed to sustain a small, backwards population of humans. They were incredibly primitive, but possessed of superior physical reflexes and abilities. They were stronger, faster, and more agile than nearly any other human standard recorded to date. Suspicion arose immediately. Could they be mutants of some sort, disgusting refuse of the Great Crusade, left here to rot and mutate and fester? Dozens of samples were dragged off to the chapter's laboratories and put through rigorous tests by the librarians and the chaplains and the sanguinary priests of the chapter, and yet despite their superior physical abilities, no sign of mutation or significant abnormality was detected. They were not merely within the tolerable ranges for a stable mutant offshoot of humanity, they were pure. This was the chapter's salvation. Amit ordered a permanent bastion to be erected on the planet. These people would become the aspirants and their recruiting stock for the flesh terrors. No better recruits could be found anywhere in the galaxy. And far more importantly, the planet that now received its official imperial name of Cretacea would be their new birthplace, as Cretacea means the birth of wrath. Azir Ahmet saw in the planet a version of himself and his flesh terrors. To an observer, far away, high up in orbit, the planet was shrouded in dark, rolling, obscuring clouds. They might be frightening, disturbing to look upon, but no more than other dangerous natural phenomenons, no more than other savage Astartes chapters. But below on the surface was a treacherous, 
deadly jungle filled with monsters lurking in every shadow. Monsters that needed to be chained and tamed forever, permanently shackled to the will of the chapter. And at the same time, for all the darkness, for all the ambiguity, for all the heavy clouds, the planet also contained a future, a stable human population to replenish the ranks of the flesh terrors. They would not wither, they would not go quietly into the night, they had been given a chance to redeem themselves. And that became almost its own little religion within the Flesh Terrors. The doctrine of Nazir Ahmet that somehow this mysterious world would provide the answer to their problems, would give them the answer to the Black Rage and a salvation from the Red Thirst. Nazir Ahmet himself believed it until he eventually departed the chapter for areas unknown towards the outer edges of the galaxy. What exactly happened to him is still unknown, though his helmet was discovered as part of a large ancient flesh terrors warship merged into a space hulk. And the man who discovered the helmet should be well known to all of you by now. His successor, Gabriel Seth. Upon discovering the helmet, of course, he downloaded its visual logs to get some sort of a hint as to what happened to the long-lost chapter master. But upon viewing the images, Gabriel fell unconscious under the sway somehow of the helmet which was immediately shattered by Harahel, the Flash Terror's first company champion. Upon regaining his senses, Gabriel Seth could only state that what he had seen was a universe of blood, which he could only describe as the end. Hmm. Mysterious, mysterious. And that just about covers the founding myth of the Flesh Terrors chapter, their beginning. Oh, I suppose calling a few thousand years of crusading merely a prologue. <laughs> oh, by 40k standards, I suppose it fits. The modern day flesh terrors under Gabriel Seth has, as we talked about in his lore video, tried to improve upon their image. They want to become something more than merely blood-maddened berserkers. They want to be recognized as true sons of Sanguinius, as angels all. And so under Seth, they have developed a new combat doctrine, scouring the galaxy for the very earliest signs of invasions, of warfare, of treachery in all its many forms, so that they can dispatch companies of battle brothers to crush the enemy before it becomes a threat noticed by the wider Imperium, allowing the Flesh Terrors to engage with all the usual abandon of their kind whilst keeping unfortunate civilian observers to an absolute minimum. And the Flesh Terrors aren't doing this for no reason. Whilst Gabriel Seth may be as noble a chapter master as any, and he has high hopes that his battle brothers will be able to emulate his example, the Black Rage is strong in the Flesh Terrors. In the least severe of instances, he can drive entire squads temporarily mad and send them into a killing frenzy, butchering anyone nearby regardless of allegiance. This, as you can probably imagine, is a trait that does not go along well with deployment near civilian populations, as we saw on Armageddon. It also means... Um, that the chapter is not able to sustain large-scale deployments for extended periods. The hit-and-run tactics of the chapter crossing small localized threats before they can grow is not merely a part of the PR stunt, it is also necessary. The Flesh Terrors need short, sharp, decisive engagements because extended combat 
is what drains them more than anything else. With those brothers who succumb fully to the Black Rage, responsible for more casualties amongst the Flesh Terrors than actual combat casualties are. The rate at which brothers are lost to the rage is so quick that the chapter has no chance of replenishing its ranks quickly enough, to the point that they have now fallen to 400 brothers, and if the current rate of attrition continues, they will be lucky to have even two full companies left in a century or two. This has led the Flesh Terrors to do something that all their brothers would almost surely consider heresy, possibly, and at the very least cruel, inhumane, and disrespectful treatment of their honoured fallen. You see, all other Blood Angels chapters tend to isolate those brothers who fall prey to the Black Rage. They form them into so-called death companies. Their armor is painted black, and they are sent screaming towards the enemy where, God Emperor willing, they will find a worthy, valorous death at the hands of the enemy, preferably with their hands tightening around their necks as they die. The Black Rage itself may be a topic for another video soon, possibly, but suffice to say, the Black Rage, as the name implies, drives them completely mad, and they have no regard for their own safety. Couple this with the fact that they are usually herded into the teeth of the fiercest enemy resistance, it should come as small surprise that very few warriors survive their first engagement. Those who do often die shortly thereafter due to their extensive wounds. Those who survive are taken care of by the chapter's chaplains. A handful may still be deemed sane enough for another deployment or safe enough for continued storage in heavy irons clamped about their limbs on spaceships deep within dungeons and special areas set over to the chaplains administering to their needs. But more often than not, the brothers will have been driven so insane by the carnage that the only next step will be the Red Thirst, from which there is no coming back. Well, except for that one example, of course. And so in most cases, those brothers that have simply gone too far to be maintained safely will be put to rest by their chaplains. But the Flesh Terrors don't do this. Not the last part. No matter how far gone a brother is, he will be captured. He will be brought back aboard specially designed chambers aboard the Flesh Terror's flagship, and he will be allowed honorable death in combat, regardless of the danger he might pose to those around him. And when a brother is so far gone as to be impossible to contain safely, they are interned within the sarcophagus hull of a dreadnought where they become a Death Company Dreadnought. If a blood-maddened Astartes is a terrifying proposition, imagine a two-legged walking tank driven insane by bloodthirst. And incidentally, these are the only pieces of armor the Flesh Terrors employ in large numbers. The rest of the chapter has a few rhinos, some razorbacks, a handful of whirlwinds, and one or two predators. But they have been known to deploy Death Company dreadnoughts in significant numbers. This obviously gives them an incredible assault force, though do not make the mistake of thinking the Flesh Terrors are merely an attacking chapter. Yes, they certainly prefer close quarters combat, and by and large they will deploy as assault marines, but quite rare within Astartes' chapters. Um, the Flesh Terrors actually train their brothers in a variety of roles. 
allowing them to take up the position of a tactical marine, a devastator, or an assault specialist, regardless of their usual company assignment. Normally, within a Codex-compliant chapter, certain companies might specialize in certain things. Assault squads will not pick up heavy bolters and become devastators, or vice versa, but due to the ever-shrinking numbers of the Flesh Terrors, this degree of specialization is a luxury they can ill afford. This in turn dictates the Flesh Terrors combat doctrines. On the one hand, it allows them a far greater deal of flexibility than other chapters of the same size. But their size and lack of armor also forces them towards a hit-and-run strategy. They would not be able to engage in large-scale armored warfare against enemies or wars of protracted maneuvers due to their limited transport capacity. Instead, the Flash Terrors prefer to arrive from orbit, in drop pods or Thunderhawks, hammering into the very heart of the enemy, seeking a decisive singular engagement to end the threat immediately. If the foe is too large, too dispersed, or too well entrenched for this tactic to be carried out immediately, they will instead launch several minor assaults of this nature, picking away at the enemy's strength with overwhelming local force, until eventually, hopefully, forcing the enemy out into the open where they can be obliterated by a direct drop pod strike. And these tactics have proven successful, both in defeating the enemy and in ensuring minimal contact with other allies. It was during a failure to carry out these limited operations during the Armageddon War that brought the chapter the closest it has ever come to actual annihilation. Not at the hands of the enemy, but at the hands of their brother Astartes. The trial we talked about in the Gabriel Seth video. Eventually, however, the Flesh Terrors would come to the Blood Angels' aid during the devastation of Baal, where the Blood Angels, their successor chapters, and the Flesh Terrors were eventually rescued by the Ultra Smurfs. <laughs> A fact that does not sit particularly well with the Flesh Terrors or Gabriel Seth. And now, let's talk about that, shall we? The Primaris Marines. See, back in the day, 40k had snakes. It had tragic stories. The Flesh Terrors were one of them. They are a noble chapter. They are fighting against their curse with every iota of their being. They are searching for salvation. They are trying to save themselves. And yet, their ancient curse is dragging them down engagement by engagement, war by war, conflict by conflict. An inevitable, slow, tragic chiseling down of their strength. And the only future appears to be the end seen in their chapter master's helmet. And then the blueberries arrived, and voila, they're back to full chapter strength again. <laughs> oh god, I hate the Chimera's Marines so very, very much. Oh, no. Oh. oh, Jesus. Though, though, there is something interesting going on as well. Initially, Games Workshop decided that the Primaris Marines would simply be superer super soldiers, flawless space marines accepted into all of the chapters without so much as a question or where the hell did you find these or you did what to Sanguinius Gene Seed you said? But realizing that that was not only Incredibly stupid, unbelievably disrespectful to the law that came before it, and really goddamn boring. That decision has been backtracked upon, and now the Primaris Marines as well are beginning to fall prey to the Black Rage. 
Now, I have yet to hear a mention of a specific Primaris Marine falling prey within the Flesh Terrors, or the Blood Drinkers, or even the Angel Sanguine, or the Million. But... There is a specific mention of Primaris Marines being inducted into the Death Company in the Angels in Carmine. So clearly, something is going on. Now, whether or not this is a part of an actual plot in the development, or merely simply Games Workshop deciding, alright, that was pretty goddamn stupid. Sim Salabim! Psh! Retconius! I suppose we will have to wait and see. Although, if I am to be entirely honest, I do not see a way of turning the Primaris Marines interesting right now. I really don't. Even if you give them the flaws of the previous chapters, so what? They're now simply just a space marine that needed retconning to be as interesting as the old space marines. Maybe you're gonna make Belisanius call into a Vinland? Some kind of deep-seated mutation? The problem with going grimdark is that you have to keep it on the edge of destruction at all times. The moment you pull away from the abyss, it's no longer grim dark. And anything you do later on to go like, oh no no no, to look to to totally, there are still stakes, it will simply just come across as hollow and, well, frankly, pandering. People stated that you'd done something dumb and now you're rushing to go, oh no no, believe us, we're totally gonna make this interesting again. Guess we'll have to wait and see on that regard as well. As it stands right now, in the modern day lore, the Flesh Terrors are again, as mentioned, at full chapter strength. And there haven't been any specific mentions of Primaris Marines in the Flesh Terrors succumbing to the rage. In fact, there is a specific mention of the Flesh Terrors curse having been considerably lessened by the introduction of the Primaris Marines. In fact, this is one of the reasons that it caused Gabriel Seth to doubt them in the first place and suggest that they might just be Ultramarines in red power armor. Because as he very accurately pointed out, if these new blood angels do not suffer from the curse of Sanguinius, then how could they possibly be real children of the angel? If they cannot see his last moments, they do not have that connection to the Primarch, they might as well be blueberries instead. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.